This video is sponsored by Lumerit. Lumerit, a better way to do college. Antigonid dominance in the Near East is in jeopardy. Following the debacle at Gaza, enemies to the west, east and south surround Antigonus and his son Demetrius. Yet they still have enough supporters to push back. The fate of Alexander's empire is still in the balance and the winner of the wars of his successors remains undecided. With his army shattered at Gaza, Demetrius moved north to Cilicia. Ptolemy now pressed his advantage, reclaiming territories as far north as Tyre. As for Seleucus, Ptolemy gave his allies some troops to head east and reassert his authority in Babylon. News that Demetrius had returned to northern Syria with a small army reached Ptolemy when he was in Sili, Syria. Believing Demetrius was finished, Ptolemy ordered one of his generals, Chiles, to lead an army north and crush the remnants of the Antigonids' forces. This proved careless, as Demetrius successfully ambushed Chiles' army near a town called Myus, capturing 7,000 troops and much wealth in the process. Buoyed with this victory, Demetrius returned to his base and requested reinforcements from his father, Antigonus. In the meantime, Antigonus had defeated Asander's remaining forces in Caria and had taken control of Asia's Aegean coastline. On receiving Demetrius's letter, he once again headed east in late 312 BC, he arrived in Syria and, joining with Demetrius, quickly recaptured all the lands that had been lost, forcing Ptolemy to retreat to Egypt. Antigonus followed in pursuit, arriving at the border of Ptolemy's domain with over 80,000 men. Yet his gaze would be quickly diverted to the southeast, where the Nabataeans were hostile to him. Antigonus decided to launch a campaign against these people to secure his flanks. His son besieged Petra, but the campaign proved costly, time-consuming and indecisive. In the end, an agreement was reached, with no real gains on either side. In the fall of 311 BC, Antigonus received news that Seleucus had defeated the Antigonid army in Iran and recaptured Babylon. Upon hearing this, Antigonus shelved any plans to invade Egypt. The threat of losing his eastern provinces to Seleucus was too great. Desiring to march on Babylon, Antigonus proposed peace talks with his fellow successors, most notably Cassander and Lysimachus. Ptolemy was later also included, and, in the end, a treaty was reached and peace agreed. The ramifications of this peace would be far-reaching, most notably in Macedonia. Its governor, Cassander, was not eager to share his power. He ordered the execution of Alexander the Great's son and his mother, Roxanne. The Argia dynasty of Alexander and Philip had been wiped out. The consequences would soon be clear for all to see. Back in Syria, Antigonus was now free to focus on Seleucus. He dispatched Demetrius with 19,000 men to tackle this problem. In the beginning of 310 BC, Demetrius and his army reached Babylon. Seleucus had already left the city with most of his forces and the city was captured without a fight. Yet one of the citadels remained in Seleucus's control and defiantly resisted. Not being able to afford a lengthy siege, Demetrius left 6,000 of his troops under the command of his general, Archelaus, to continue the siege while he returned west to his impatient father. Yet Seleucus proved a dogged opponent, and later that year, 
Antigonus was forced to lead an army east to fight this enemy. Our knowledge of this war, dubbed the Babylonian War, is almost non-existent. Yet what we do know is that following Antigonus's sacking of Babylon, Seleucus defeated Antigonus in a major battle in 308 BC, and a peace was agreed. In this act, Antigonus's hold on the east was severed, and the aging general returned to the west. Meanwhile, a new threat had been growing for Antigonus. His old adversary, Ptolemy, had been secretly intriguing against him, gaining territory and influence in the Aegean. Determined to reassert his power, Antigonus ordered his son, Demetrius, to cross over from Ephesus and take Greece from Cassander. The short-lived peace was at an end. Demetrius landed at Athens in 307 BC and quickly gained control of the region. Further successes followed at both Megara and Munichia. Yet Antigonus was eager to weaken Ptolemy by taking his most prized possession, the island of Cyprus. And so he ordered Demetrius to leave Greece with his army and return east. In early 306 BC, Demetrius departed Athens with most of his army and headed towards Cyprus. On his way, he stopped at Rhodes, hoping to add the formidable Rhodian navy to his forces. Yet the Rhodians, claiming neutrality, refused. Demetrius continued east and soon reached Cilicia, where more troops awaited him, sent from his father. Reinforced, Antigonus's son crossed over to Cyprus, landing on the Carpass Peninsula with 15,000 infantry and 400 cavalry in the spring of 306 BC. He also had 110 triremes, 53 heavy warships and many troop transports. Demetrius quickly solidified his position on the island, capturing the towns of Carpasia and Urania. He then turned to his main goal, the city of Salamis. As Demetrius approached Salamis, the Ptolemaic forces stationed there, some 12,000 infantry and 800 cavalry under the command of Ptolemy's brother, Menelaus, were awaiting his arrival on a nearby plain. Battle ensued, and Demetrius won the victory, killing a thousand and capturing 3,000 of Menelaus's forces. With his remaining forces, Menelaus retreated to Salamis. Demetrius now began to besiege the city on both land and sea. He had had previous expertise of sieges before then, most notably at Munichia, and he therefore had many siege weapons in his army. Mechanical engines such as catapults, designed especially to help assault a settlement. To aid him further, Demetrius also ordered the construction of some formidable siege engines, including two battering rams and a siege tower. Yet this was no ordinary siege tower. Nine stories high, it was the largest the world had yet seen. It was called the Helepolis, the taker of cities. Over a month was needed to construct the engines, but finally, they were ready. Demetrius ordered the assault, and both the rams and Helepolis succeeded in clearing the walls of Menelaus' defenders. Soon, the city appeared to be on the brink of defeat. Yet that night, Menelaus sallied out from Salamis and burnt down Demetrius' siege engines. With them destroyed, the city gained the respite it desperately needed. Demetrius was unable to capture the city, and the siege continued. Before Demetrius had been able to finish his blockade, Menelaus had sent word to his brother of the situation. Gathering a large army and navy, Ptolemy sailed over to Cyprus, arriving at Paphos with a fleet of 140 warships 
and 200 troop transports carrying 10,000 infantry. He then proceeded along the south coast of the island, where he was further bolstered by his Ptolemaic allies on Cyprus. Very quickly, he reached Kition. There, Ptolemy managed to get word to Menelaus. He knew that if they could combine their naval forces together, their force would have a great numerical advantage over their foe. He ordered Menelaus to sneak the 60 ships he had in Salamis out of the harbour under the cover of night and join him. Yet Demetrius got word of Ptolemy's plans. That night, he placed both his siege equipment and best men aboard his ships, and sailing around to the harbour of Salamis, made sure that any attempt by Menelaus to sneak past his lines proved impossible. As Menelaus's forces failed to arrive, Ptolemy realized his plans had been foiled. Nevertheless, he sailed round Cape Pedalium with his armada and prepared for battle. On seeing Ptolemy's arrival, Demetrius quickly reorganized. He left ten ships to blockade the narrow exit of Salamis's harbor, preventing Menelaus's sally. The rest of his navy he placed facing Ptolemy. On his left, Demetrius deployed his greatest ships in a double line, hoping to quickly crush Ptolemy's right. Demetrius stationed himself in the front ranks of this wing, although he himself was not to be in command. Realizing his inexperience at naval warfare, he had deferred command to his most experienced admiral, Medius of Larissa. Demetrius deployed the rest of his ships in a single line. Adopting a similar strategy, Ptolemy strengthened his own left wing, hoping to quickly break through his opponent's right. The battle commenced with an advance by Demetrius against Ptolemy's right. Very quickly, Demetrius' most powerful warships, aided by siege engines they had attached to them, destroyed the opposing forces. Medius now ordered the ship's right in order to start folding up Ptolemy's line with Demetrius himself being in the thickest of the action. Meanwhile, Ptolemy had successfully overcome Demetrius's right flank. Yet his attack proved too slow, and as he began to envelop Demetrius's center, he saw with dismay that the rest of his fleet was already routed. Believing the battle lost, Ptolemy retreated. Meanwhile, Menelaus had successfully managed to break through the blockade. Yet it would prove too late. By the time Menelaus had entered the fray, Ptolemy was already in flight. The engagement had been a disaster for Ptolemy. Over 40 warships and 100 supply ships were captured, along with their crews. As for Demetrius, only 20 of his ships had been damaged although scholars now debate whether Demetrius lost more on his right wing. The implications of this victory were far-reaching. Salamis duly surrendered to Demetrius, and Menelaus retreated to Alexandria. As Salamis fell, all other Ptolemaic holdings in Cyprus followed suit. In total, Demetrius captured 16,000 infantry and 600 cavalry many of whom then joined the Antigonid army. For Ptolemy, the battle had been a disaster, losing control of Cyprus, his most cherished possession. Yet for the Antigonids, Demetrius's victory meant that their power was now unmatched on both land and sea. They were the superpower, but more challenges would soon follow. We often say that we want our channel to be a gateway to more learning, and the sponsor of this video might help our viewers with just that. Lumerit Scholar is the best way to save a ton of money on your bachelor's degree, and if you haven't graduated college yet, they'll help you find the best way to graduate quickly and affordably. Lumerit will allow you to save money on less expensive online courses and transfer the credits into your school. 
You can support our channel and get a free quote at lumeric.com forward slash kings and generals or by clicking the link in the description. Thanks for watching the fourth video in our series on the Wars of the Diadochi. This series will continue, so subscribe and press the alarm bell to get notified. We release videos every Thursday and Sunday, so there is much more to come. We try to answer every comment and appreciate each like and share. These videos are made possible by our brilliant patrons over at Patreon and YouTube sponsors. You can join the ranks of our supporters via the links in the description and get many perks, like early access to the videos, info on our schedule, the ability to vote on the upcoming series, and so much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you in the next one.